Good, good. Thank you. Good. Um, let me tell you that Kirkwood's mom and dad are here. Right back here, the Bullises. Uh, I graduated with Miss Bullis, and you were there at school at the same time, right? Yeah. Graduated with you as well? S yeah. Good. Well, we're glad y'all are here. She went, to choir she went to choir practice. Okay. And um, you're just north of Baltimore, and they have just completed and gotten their occupancy permit for their building. That been ten years. Good. Great. Well, we're glad. We're glad you're here. Um, since we were in school together, I guess Kirkwood is like my son. I threaten to whoop him every now and then. No, I don't. You know, for most everybody on staff, they could just about be my kids, <laughs> with the exception of Ross and Jeff. So, uh, and I, I, I kind of feel like they are. Um, so we're glad y'all are here, and uh, I'm glad you're here tonight. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and look with uh, me at uh, the 39th chapter of Genesis. You can get there. I'm going to start off. I've got a little bit of an introduction I want to do. Uh, just to the north, uh, the northern side of Lake Geneva in Switzerland, there's a small island that is there, and on that island is a fortress, a medieval Swiss fortress, uh, the Castle Kilion. It's a beautiful place. Uh, it's one of the most popular places to go. The only way to access it is by that drawbridge right there. Used to be a, a drawbridge, but that bridge that they've built there, the only way to get to it, it has these turrets around close to the land on that side. It's got these massive dining halls lined with um, uh, suits of armor. Uh, but none of that is why that place is famous. It's famous because of a prisoner that was there, a guy by the name of French Catholic priest by the name of Francois Bonnevard. Francois Bonnevard who was kept prisoner there from 1532. Not yet. Let's go back. Keep it there. 1532 to 1536, uh, four years prisoner there, uh, was kept down in the very belly of that castle, right there where you see the water lapping up next to that solid piece of granite, which is the foundation for that fortress, his, his dungeon cell was down there at that water level. You had to go down this dark, long, winding path, hallway, stone hallway, past all these cells, down to the further cell away, behind an iron and oak door, uh, that, uh, that French Catholic priest was kept. He said that he walked that... Uh, sail so much in those four years that he wore a path in the granite. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, uh, but uh, the thing that came out of his four years there is that he came to Christ and he became a Protestant. Lord Byron went there, saw where Bonnevard was kept, and he wrote a sonnet, Kilion, thy prison is a holy place. And thy sad floor an altar for t'was trod until his very steps have left a trace. Worn is if thy cold pavement were a sod by Bonnevard. May none those marks efface, for they appeal from tyranny to God. He was kept there, and yet out of that prison came a man who gave his life to Christ. You can go from there in Switzerland now all the way over to Bedford's jail. There's Bunyan, John Bunyan, Baptist preacher, separatist, nonconformist, because he was not an Anglican and he preached. They threw him in Bedford jail for three months. Twelve years later, he got out. Because they would go to him and say, will you not preach? And he said, I will. 
You let me out and I will preach. In fact, he used to preach out of the window there. Now, that was his little girl uh, who was blind. And for 12 years, he longed to see her. Every now and then, they would let his wife and his little girl come see him. But for 12 years, he stayed there in Bedford's jail. Yet out of that dungeon cell came one of the greatest books of all time called Pilgrim's Progress. He wrote there. From there, go to Germany. Go to Wartburg, to the castle in Wartburg. And here on that side, that little piece that you see sticking out of Wartburg Castle right there was the room in which they kept confined Martin Luther. Now, they didn't hold him there as a prisoner so much. They all supported Luther. They kept him there to keep the Roman church from killing him. And yet out of that little room right there where that those two little windows are, I believe that's where it was, in that little room right there out came the German New Testament that turned Europe upside down. He was there for years. You can go from there and you go across now to our day uh, to a guy by the name of John Leland who would stand in a Virginia prison cell and would lift himself up to the window and would preach the gospel and hundreds came to Christ under the preaching of this man who preached from that window out of that jail cell where he spoke to James Madison and told Madison that he would run against him in Congress if he would not support um, uh, 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 an amendment to the Constitution that allowed religious freedom. That guy right there, Baptist preacher, by the way, he knew and went to Washington years later to preach to, of all people, Thomas Jefferson in a federal building, no less. Thomas Jefferson, Baptist preacher, federal building, preached. Now, let's get to the last century. Martin Niemöller. Martin Niemöller, this man was a U-boat captain in World War I and was so outstanding as a U-boat captain, he was awarded the, the Iron Cross. World War I ends. He feels God calling him to ministry, becomes a preacher in the church there in Germany. Uh, the Evangelistik Kirche Deutschland, the Evangelistic Church of Germany, and um, speaks out against, in the late 30s, speaks out against Adolf Hitler. Hitler calls him to his office. This preacher walks into Hitler's office, and Hitler tells him, you go back and you tend to the church, and I will take care of the people. And Martin Niemöller says, God gave me the care not only of the church, but of the people, and you don't have the power to take it away. Hitler threw him in the concentration camp in Munich, which is um, Dachau. Threw him in Dachau for those years of World War II, was going to kill him. He claimed that he was the personal prisoner of Adolf Hitler. Pastors who knew him would come see Martin Niemöller there in Dachau, and they would look at him in the cell, and they would say, Martin! In days like these, why are you in here? And Niemöller would look back and say, in days like these, why are you not in here? And from a prison cell, like all the others, this man preached the gospel to a nation under Nazism. God has done some amazing things with men in prison. And you're going to see one of them tonight. Genesis chapter 39. You've got um, Joseph who is going to be thrown. The Hebrew word there in Genesis uh, 39 and 40 is literally a pit, a hole in the ground. It evidently was one of these 
uh, dungeons dug out from out of the limestone uh, there in the sands of Egypt. And that's where he was put, along with a lot of other people at the time. He was put in that dungeon. Now, put your finger there in uh, Genesis chapter 39 and go with me all the way over to Psalm 105. Because in Psalm 105, you've got the psalmist who's giving some of the history of ancient Israel. Uh, there are several psalms that will do this, that will kind of move you through all of the history of Israel, and they, f and they give you an interest. The psalmist will give you an interesting view of Joseph in this dungeon where he is held prisoner. So look with me, Psalm 105, and let me just read this to you, beginning in verse 16. And he called for a famine upon the land, that's God, and broke the whole staff of bread. There was nothing to eat anywhere, in other words. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave, and they afflicted his feet with fetters, and he himself was laid in irons. In other words, Joseph just wasn't only in the dungeon cell, he was chained up. Bonivard was chained up in that cell in the castle Kilion. He was chained up to the wall there in the castle. Verse 19, until the time that his word came to pass, God's word, the word of the Lord tested him. Now, let me just stop right there. It goes on, but I'm going to come back to it. So there you get a picture of what it was like for Joseph in jail. He was in prison. They had put chains on his around his ankles, and they had chained him up in irons, evidently, to the wall. And uh, he was there until God's word came that it was time for him to go out. Well, that'll just give you a little bit of a mindset. Now go with me back to Genesis chapter, uh, chapter 39, where we left Joseph, and where we left Joseph, when we left Joseph, he's standing outside the house, and his coat is in there in the hands of Miss Potiphar. Now that's the situation. You know the story. You know what's going on here. There he is in that place uh, of um, position, in the house of Potiphar, and now she's put a move on him, and uh, he's outside with no coat, and the coat's inside with her. Uh, you've got to just wonder about all of this as this happens to Joe. You would have thought, you know what? Um, you've just got to ask God, God, why, what in the world? Why do you let this happen to this kid? He seems like a good boy. He seems like a good kid. Why in the world is all this bad stuff happening to him? Why do you let this go on and on and on? Because this is a guy that every time you see him, he's being obedient to what he's told to do. You go back to chapter 37 and verse 2. Chapter 37, verse 2. His brothers had done something, and it was reported throughout a whole area of Shechem. And so Joseph goes back to his father in Hebron and says, Listen, Dad, I... I, I, I hate to do this, but I've got to tell it to you because I don't want somebody from Shechem coming down here and telling you what my brothers have done. I, I would rather tell you than you be caught flat-footed, egg on your face. You'd had no idea of what's happened because it states there in chapter 3 that it was noise to break. It, in other words, people knew what these boys, we don't know what they had done, but uh, everybody else there knew what they had done. And so he goes and he gives his father the report. It was the right thing to do. His father takes him a little later in that same chapter and tells him, I want you to go and find your brothers and bring me back a report on them. So he leaves. He leaves Hebron. He goes to Shechem. He can't find them in Shechem. Somebody tells him that they've gone to Hebron, which is a long ways further north. So he goes on up there to Dothan, I'm sorry, goes on up to Dothan from Shechem to find his brothers so that he can do what his father told him. Every time you see this boy, he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's being obedient as best he can be. So you come to the house of Potiphar, and there at the house of Potiphar, everything that is given him, he does it, and he does it with excellence. He does it really to the glory of God, and there is produce that is coming in. There is profit that is coming in 
because of the work of Joseph. So you begin to wonder, what, you know, what in the world? This guy is as faithful as he can be. He's always doing the right thing, and yet he's always being punished. How many times have you said, no good deed goes unpunished? We all say that. You do something, you take, you take off of work, you're going to take something to somebody. Somebody's been in the hospital, somebody's been sick. Somebody is just in need, and so you take some time off. You go, you pull up to the curb, you run it up there, you go in, you set whatever it is down, you get back to your car, and somebody's put a ticket on your car, right? You take off of work, you take somebody to the doctor, you take them down to the hospital, they're going for an MRI, they're going for some test. You're gracious enough to do it. You take them, you pull out of the parking lot to take them back home, and wham, you run right into the back of somebody. No good deed goes unpunished. You're at work. You're as faithful as you can be, but you stand for the things of God. You take a biblical stand. There are just some things that you're not going to do. You're not going to be unethical. You're going to maintain your integrity. And what happens? You get fired. The guy that you've been working by lies all the time. And what happens to him? He gets promoted. You get fired. And you think to yourself, Lord, what in the world is going on here? I've got a psalm for you. Psalm 73, verse 13. Listen to this. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and washed my hands in innocence. Basically what the psalmist is saying, God, why do I even try? Why do I even try? Why do I do the right things? Why do I do all the things that you tell me to do? And now look how it always turns out this way. Joseph had finally gotten to a good place. It's not home, but he had gotten to a good place. Uh, he had proven himself. He would gained back maybe a little bit of self-respect. Maybe he had a little sense of, of uh, meaning and purpose now. And, and as soon as he gets there, this thing blows up in his face. And now he's facing prison because this woman tried to put a move on him and he was not going to respond to it. Now, what I want you to see in this is I want you to see how Joseph responds. In all of this, Joseph, listen, he doesn't get bitter. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't throw his hands up and say, I quit. He doesn't say, God, I'm just going to walk out of this Sunday school class. I'm not going to do anything with this anymore. I just give up on it. I walk out of this children's program. I walk out of the music program. I just can't do it. I give up. I'm done. I'm finished. He doesn't do that. In fact, if anything, Joseph becomes increasingly more thoughtful, increasingly kinder. He becomes far more dependent on God and not less dependent on God. He is going to respond the right way to every single thing that happens to him. And bad things, listen, this isn't the end of bad things happening to him. So just notice how Joseph always responds. Now, I want to show you something about God in all of this. When you come beginning in verse 19, I'm going to give you one point tonight. One thing that I want you to think about and I want you to see, and it's this. God does not need perfect conditions to perfect us. God doesn't need perfect conditions to perfect us. You know, sometimes we get caught up in all these things that happen and we wonder why and we say, Lord, why do I even try? And we think, well, God, if you're going to do anything with this, you've got to solve all this mess that's going on first. We think God can't ever do anything in our lives unless there are perfect conditions, perfect circumstances, perfect situation. I have to wake up to the right song on the radio in the morning. It's got to, it's got to be the very right song. The moon's got to be in the right phase. You know, Saturn has got to align with Pluto, whatever it is. Everything's got to be exactly right before anything can get straightened out. And we go to God, we say, God, you got to straighten all this mess out before you can ever do anything in my life. Now, Joseph never says that to God. 
He doesn't say, God, you got to get me out of here and you got to get me back home. You get, get me in my father's house and you got to, you know, put a little bit of weight on me and I've got to get back there where I can take a good bath and I've got to get in some clean clothes and I've got to have the right, to, you know, all these things have got to be right before I can ever do anything, before you can ever use me, before you can ever work in my life. We've got to have the right condition. God doesn't need perfect conditions to begin to do a work of perfection in your life. In fact, just the opposite is true. Now, let me show you three things. Number one, and there's no clock tonight, which, which means, hey, you know, okay, have it your way. Um, no, let me give you three quick things tonight as we look at this. Number one, a prison uh, may be God's place of protection. I think that's how it works out for Joseph. Um, when we come to this story, I think we give Miss Potiphar a little bit too much attention and we give Potiphar too little attention. Now, I went into a little bit of this last Wednesday night and just to begin to show you, um, she screams. Joseph has run, he ran out of the house. She screamed. He left his garment. And she called for the men to come in there. So all the, which is an odd thing to me, which is bizarre to me. I can't figure, figure out why she does that, but she does that. She called to the men of the house. They all come in and then she starts to spin this story and um, give this false account of what happened uh, that is going to put Joseph. Really, you would think this is going to be his death. Because here is Potiphar, he is the head executioner. Remember I shared with you, Alfred Edersheim, the great Jewish uh, Old Testament scholar, claimed that what this meant when it said that he was the chief of the bodyguards is that he was the head executioner. He's the guy that put everybody to death. And he doesn't do that. And he doesn't do that because I think he knows Joseph. He not only knew Joseph, we, we're, we see that. He not only knows Joseph, but he's begun to believe that Joseph's God is the one that is with Joseph and making Joseph so profitable. Now, we're told that in chapter 39. Just look at verse 3, and we see that. He burns with anger, but we're not told who he's angry at. I think he's angry at his wife. Now, this is just me. I don't have anything in the text to prove this. This, you know, you can disagree with me if you want to and be wrong. But this is just what I think. I think his anger burns at his wife. I think he knows this isn't Joseph. I haven't seen anything like this in this boy's life. All I've heard out of this kid is how committed he is to his Lord and how good his Lord is to him. And look, he's a slave in my house. And yet he's still telling me how good God is to him. This is not what this boy does. This kid could not do something like this. But I do know my wife. And I do know what my wife is capable of. And I do know that my wife probably has some history. Because as I shared with you before, I don't think this is the first time this has ever happened. And he doesn't kill Joseph, but he puts him. And if you read the passage here, he puts him, the, he puts him in the king's jail. Do you know what that is? That's white collar prison. That's where Pharaoh would put those leaders, those political leaders, those people with clout, those people with power, that's where he would put the white collar people was in the king's prison. Now, personally, I see the hand of God all over this. I think it gets Joseph into a place where he is protected. If he's not under directly under Potiphar, then he's in the next best place where he could be protected. And let me tell you something. Egypt was different when it came to women than were the Hebrews. Miss Potiphar had some power of her own. And most likely, these men that she called in there, she wanted one of them to do something to Joseph. And so God takes prison and he moves Joseph into a place that is a place of protection for his life. Now, I just thought today to myself, how many places have I been in that I felt like this is a prison? 
Why has God got me in this? Listen, let me tell you something. As a, as a 17, 18 year old, I felt like I was a prisoner at home. I got out of daddy's house. You know what? I wanted back in. <laughs> Please take me back. <laughs> uh, daddy's house was not, not a bad place at all. But listen, let me tell you something. When you're a 16, 17, 18 year old kid, you feel like home sometimes can be a prison. I felt like, I honestly felt like, I've, had, I've been in school, it seems like, my entire life. There have been times in my life I felt like this school is a prison. This dormitory room is a, is a prison cell. This school is, is prison. I can't wait to get out of here because I want to get married. I want to start life. I want to go to work. I want to do something. I've been in places, some people tragically feel like that their marriage and their home is a prison. And they don't have a marriage mate, they've got a sale mate. And it has become a prison. You just stop and think about the places that through your life you felt like this is a prison. And listen, if you look back and think about it, you may see that during that time, God had you in a place where he protected you. I'm going to tell you, I was in, I was at North Greenville. It was up into the mountain. It was at the very, up, up in that area they call the dark corner of South Carolina. You don't know about that. But it's, it, it's toward that area they call the dark corner. It's up in the mountains, almost into the mountains of North Carolina. And there I was, all, we were off, North Greenville was so far out in the boonies. You, you listen, it was just way out. And I look back on that, and I felt like I can't get out of here to go get a decent meal. All I can eat is this stuff that comes out of the dining hall. And I wanted to get, you know, I'd want to get home because that's where she was. And uh, mom and dad were there. And I was stuck up there in that place. And I look back, and I think to myself, it's a good thing that I was miles away from civilization because I could have gotten into a pile of stuff. And it turned out that God had me in a place right where he wanted me, where I could not get into trouble. And it turned out to be a place of protection. And there were a lot of times I felt like this is just a jail. Well, let me give you the second thing. Prison may be a place of God's promotion. Now, let me just take you to the first verse of chapter 40. I'm not going to get any further than that, but just to that first verse there. It came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king, and he throws them in the king's prison. Now, let me tell you, the baker had an important position, Mr. Baker. He had an important position. And the cupbearer was more like a cabinet member. He didn't just stand there and say, hey, king, here's your cup. He was an advisor. It was an advisory position. And uh, these two men had done something that offended Pharaoh, and he throws them into this prison. It happened to be the very prison, the king's prison, where Joseph was. Joseph meets them. They dream. You know the story. We're going to look at it. They dream dreams. He interprets the dreams. The baker loses his life. The cupbearer goes back to the, to uh, Pharaoh, to the, to the palace, to the throne room where he stands near Pharaoh. And one day Pharaoh's going to have a dream and this cupbearer is going to say, Hey, wait a minute. I know somebody that can tell you what that means. And so there in that prison, that wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't a happenstance. I am certain that Joseph would have loved for things to have been different. He didn't want to be there, uh, but he was there, and he never could see it right then. But God was working on his behalf, and he would move him from that prison into the palace because of this one single contact over about a 10 year period of time you see now we like to get in a hurry and let me just tell you something god never gets in a hurry he's never in a hurry but he is always right on time y'all remember that gospel song good lord i'd, I'd lapse into it right now if i could sing it y'all remember that four days late 
Y'all ever heard that old gospel hymn, Four Days Late? Jesus shows up four days late. But four days late, He's always on time. Woo! Always on time. Right on time. Never late. Never late. Let me give you the third thing. And the third thing is this. Is that prison is God's place of preparation. And we're probably going to come back to this whole concept next week. But I'm just going to get you into it right now. That prison became a place of preparation. Let me take you back to Psalm 105. And let me show you something there. Psalm 105, I stopped at the end of verse 18. Look at verse 19. Until the time that His Word came to pass. That's God's Word. It's referring to God's Word about Joseph. Specifically about Joseph and his situation. And the Word of uh, of the Lord tested him. God put him in that place to test him. Now the word test literally can... You can, you can understand it to mean to prepare. This whole time, God had him in that place because that was the place of preparation. He had him in a place where God could just prepare him. Now look at verse... Let me just read on from verse 20, but I'm going to get you to verse 22. The king sent and released him. The ruler of peoples and set, and set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler over all his possessions. Verse 22. Now look at this. To imprison his princes at will. Now he's talking about Joseph. He's talking about the fact that Joseph was given such a position that if he wanted to, it was up to him. He could imprison anybody he wanted to, even the princes of Pharaoh. That's what the text says. Even the princes of Pharaoh. That is, he could have put any government official he wanted to under Pharaoh in prison. That's pretty wild. That's what you call power. He could have put Potiphar vindictively in prison. He could have got Miss Potiphar and put her in prison. Now, be honest. That's the first thing I thought of. I'd have gone and got that wicked woman and I'd have put her in chains and I'd have put her in the bottom of that dungeon. Right? Not Joseph. He wasn't vindictive. What had God been doing with him? Preparing him. Preparing him all this time He wasn't bitter. He wasn't vindictive. He wasn't angry. I'm sure he didn't understand it all, but he didn't do it. Look at this next thing. Look at the last part of verse 22. That he might teach his elders wisdom. Now, elders in Scripture, is it always, it it, it can mean a number of things, but it always points to those that are older because... Uh, it is thought that those that are older are always wiser. Life experience. They've been around. Uh, not their first rodeo. And it says here, here is this young man who comes out. He's most likely late 20s, early 30s. He comes out of prison and he is the guy who sits down all the learned men of Egypt and teaches them his economic Solution to the problem that they've got coming up, which is famine. This whole thing of supply and demand, distribution, economics, he's going to teach them all of these things. Here's this young kid who's going to teach all these wise men of Egypt. And he's going to be the instructor. Where did he learn all that? All these people who passed through the king's prison. He got to speak. Well, I'm going to let you in on something. He is the Otis of the Old Testament because they turned the keys of the jail over to Joseph. Now just hang on to it. He gets to see everybody that comes through there. And he gets to talk and he gets to listen and they get to telling him 
all these things from all these different areas. This is the king's prison. This is a political prison. And they come in, and here is Joseph, and he gets a free education right there. Now, let me just, let me just ask you, is God not wise or what? What God can do in a place where you feel like you're in prison. You've never heard the name Boris Cornfell, have you? Anybody? He was a very educated Russian at the end of World War II, uh, which was a rare thing. He had a great education. He was a doctor. But he had offended Stalin, which was not hard to do. Um, and because of that, they put him in a gulag. And in that gulag, they kept him alive because he was a doctor. And not only did the prisoners need a doctor, but all of the guards there and all of the personnel there needed a doctor as well. Off in this Siberian gulag where Stalin had put him, and he was a Jew, Kornfeld, and he came to know Jesus Christ. In that prison, somebody shared the gospel with him, and Boris Kornfeld came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He longed for fellowship. He ached for fellowship. He longed to have somebody that he could share the gospel with, but he knew that if the guards overheard him, that they'd kill him. And yet he wanted so badly to share the gospel. One night they brought in a prisoner that was uh, so bad off, he thought he was going to die, but he, he performed surgery on him that night, put him under anesthesia, and as that patient was burning up with fever now, with infection, trying to come in and out of that anesthesia, conscious for just a little bit, unconscious, Boris Kornfeld poured his heart out to this, to this patient, sharing the gospel, telling him everything that Jesus had meant to him. The next morning, the patient woke up and found Boris Kornfeld had been beaten to death by the guards. But God had a plan. Because that patient who had heard the testimony of Boris that night in and out of consciousness was a genius, a literary genius, who would go on and write, and his writings would help bring down the Soviet Union. In fact, he would win the Nobel Prize for Literature because that patient who heard the testimony of a doctor who knew Christ when he needed a doctor and when he needed Christ was Alexander Solzhenitsyn who changed <laughs> from that prison cell the rest of history as we know it. It's amazing what God can do when you feel like you're locked up. Father, thank you. Thank you for your men and your women down through the years who have suffered, who have been punished and persecuted, and yet, Lord, held tenaciously to the faith. Thank you for their example. Thank you for Joseph, a young man, whose life it seems like, Lord, it was so unfair to take away all those years of his youth, and yet through that whole time, you were protecting him. And Lord, you were preparing him. And Lord, you would promote him. Help us to think about that. When we struggle and we wonder, why are we going through this? Lord, you may have us in a place that we can't begin to understand of your protection. 
and for our preparation. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.